I, I grew up in a very godly home. My father actually embraced the hyper-Calvinist position, but he was a very godly man. And he spoke to us often about how the Holy Spirit works in the souls of sinners. And, and when I was nine years old, I came under a period of six months of very deep conviction of sin, but it faded away. But when I was 14, I had a teacher, I went to a public school, who put on the board, the chalkboard, there is no God, and he signed his name beneath it and said, give me three minutes, I'll prove to you there's no God. You can have the rest of the hour to challenge me. And he used traditional arguments, which I didn't know at that time, about God not being good and allowing all these um, hundreds of thousands and of Jews to be killed by uh, Hitler and so on. And uh, I, I don't know about the theology of this, but I, I stood up and I was very shy at the time, extremely shy, and I never spoke in class. And I stood up and defended God and I said, the Jews said, let his blood be on us and our children. And he was quite astonished to see me be so open and bold and because he knew me as a shy student. So he told me to sit down. I stood up actually when I said it. He told me to sit down and he said he talked to me after class. I left class that day and I was in a turmoil inside of me because here I defended God in class but I didn't know God personally myself and that actually was the beginning of a, just a holy restlessness that I was missing God and some months later I talked my parents into being able to go with my brother, my older brother and a friend on a four-week trip out west and as we were coming back um, I was trying to convince myself that God was real by looking at the mountains and nothing, but there was no connection. Then on a Saturday morning, we had to drive 700 miles that day from Yellowstone National Park to Iowa to get to one of our denominational churches. We promised my parents we'd do that. And we couldn't find the keys anywhere. We looked everywhere. We lifted up the sleeping bags and the, searched the tent. They were nowhere. So my brother and his friend went into the woods to find a stick to try to open the trunk of the car, the boot of the car, I guess you'd say, because that was the only place they could be. And I went inside the tent and fell on my face and just cried out to God, I kind of laid a Gideon's fleece in front of him, which I know you're not, I didn't know at that time you're not supposed to do, and I just said, if you're the real and living God, please show me. And I was very earnest. And when I got off my knees, I felt something hard underneath my knees, and um, it was the keys. Now, that's a very small thing. But at that moment in my life, what happened was I became a lost sinner before God because I just realized God is real, and I'm not ready to meet Him. And I cried out for mercy. I, I wept nearly the entire way home over my sins. I went to all my friends, told them all that I could not be friends with them until I found God. And... Um, I just hold myself up in my bedroom every night, just read the Bible from beginning to end over and over and prayed and wept and searched for God. And it took about 18 months and I was just a lost, lost sinner. I was, I was really the sinner that was hanging over the pit of hell and uh, I was like a spider in the hands of God and God just had to cut the thread and I was doomed. Mm -hmm. There were times I couldn't even walk on grass because I thought God was going to swallow me up like Cora, Dathan, and Abiram. And I, I saw in those months that there's nothing good that I could perform, that I had never not sinned for one second in my life because I had never loved God above all. I never loved my neighbors myself. And the selfishness and the pride and the unbelief, it just overwhelmed me. So I thought God was fitting me to be a reprobate vessel for destruction. And then we finally got a minister in our church, and he came over to my family one day and to meet our family. My grandfather struggled a lot with assurance of faith, and he looked at my grandfather at one point in that meeting and said, for you too, Mr. Vinstreen, there's a possibility of a way of escape in Christ Jesus. Those were his exact words, and they were like penetrating my soul. And I went to bed that night, and I was just weeping with tears of joy, and my hands were like up to the heavens. I just was crying out to God and thanking Him that there was a way of salvation, even for me, even for reprobate me. And I was so full of joy 
It's like the sins roll off my back. And I went down at 3 o'clock in the morning. I got my dad out of bed and I said, Dad, I've been saved. My sins are gone. And Christ is my all. And I saw that night the passive obedience that he bore for my sins and the active obedience that he obeyed the law for me, even though I, though I didn't know those terms. I just saw the whole plan of salvation with clarity like I'd never seen before. And it was for me. And so that was the night, really, when I was saved. And then the very next day, though I was so shy, I just started going out in the neighborhood. I knocked on door after door to tell them about Jesus. And I, w I just felt I had to be a kind of evangelist in the neighborhood until somebody stumped me and I realized I'd need to know more theology. Hmm. But then about six months later, in, in, a, in a very powerful way, God called me very suddenly to the ministry. And so I was 15 at the time. And from that moment till today, I've never doubted my call for one second to the ministry. It was so real. But I just doubt myself, and I doubted my shyness, and I, I was overwhelmed by it. But um, the Lord's been very good to me, and though I still grieve over my indwelling sin a lot, um, He's made Christ increasingly precious to me all my life. And I can, I can say... He has increased, and I, I have decreased. I'm, I'm just nothing but a sinner saved by grace, and I just want to exalt my Savior. Hmm. Amen. He takes what that which is not and makes it what is. Pardon? He takes that which is not and makes it what is. There what you about your shyness? Yeah. 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 There's no glory for you. That's right. Ah, yes. Could you unpack a bit? Because I just noticed, I just checked now, and I noticed you've been 40 years since you were ordained. This year? Is that right? 40 years? Yes, yeah. Could you talk a bit, not about your whole ministry, but about how you came into the ministry and um, somewhat about maybe sure. your ministry? Sure. So when I was 15, I felt called powerfully to the ministry. And uh, I read Spurgeon's The Early Years at that point, And Spurgeon started preaching when I was 15. And I was so overwhelmed with love for God in Christ. I, I went to my dad. My dad was a ruling elder in the church for 40 years. And I said, Dad, I've got to quit high school. I, I just have to proclaim the name of Christ. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And my dad goes, well, son, I think it's better you finish high school first. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. And then I realized, of course, as I got a bit older, I needed a lot more preparation. And so I went to college. But in my third year of college, I came before our denominational committee who examines people before you enter into the school. And um, they brought me into the school the following year. And I um, took four years of schooling in St. Catharines, Ontario, under one minister and a few lessons under another minister which wasn't the best of training in the areas where those ministers were good. I had a good training, other areas I didn't. But uh, I accepted a call in 1977 at the end of the year to 700 farmers in Northwest Iowa. And I didn't know the first thing about farming. And I was called to them by the text, who knoweth whether thou art come for the, to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I didn't understand that text fully, but I just felt that was connected and drawing me to that particular church. Well, the day I was ordained, March 30, 40 years ago, uh, 78, that morning there was a church meeting and the man in the neighboring church, the minister in the neighboring church was deposed from the ministry. And that church had a thousand people. And then there were two other churches in the area that had no minister of 150 people each or so. So suddenly, as a 25-year-old man, I had 2,000 souls under my care. Um, so then I understood that text. I, was, I had to be here for such a time as this, because that big church was a hurting church. I preached for them every week. And I stayed there three and a half years, and then felt called to Franklin Lakes, New Jersey, on the East Coast, uh, to, again, a church of 700 people, this time they were all doctors and lawyers and white collar people and a very different group of people, very educated congregation. While I was there, I felt my need for more education. I went down to Westminster Seminary and uh, got my PhD. 
uh, in, in Reformation and post-Reformation theology. And then after six years, I accepted the call, or five and a half years, I accepted the call to um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I've been a pastor now for 32 years. And then about 24 years ago now, 25 actually, I we, st we, we were forced to start a new denomination, uh, and I started training men for the ministry in Puritan Reform Seminary, was established the following year. And so that's been, right now, that's 75% of my task to work in the seminary and 25% in the church. My third church, the one in Grand Rapids, was also 700 and some people. Actually, when I came, it was 1,000, but there was this terrible split 25 years ago. And um, it was a very difficult time at the beginning. I followed a minister who had been preaching there for 37 years. But um, at the same time, there were many more conversions in this church than I ever experienced before. So it's a case of going through great trial, but the Lord blessing my ministry there far more than in the other two churches combined. And so I, I love my congregation. I'm very near and dear to they're very near and dear to me, and my people are just, I just cannot leave them. So people are asking me periodically in, in my denomination, would you please go 100% into the seminary? And I just say, I can't do that because my first calling is pastoral ministry. And so I, I need to stay on, at least this point in my life, I need to stay on pastoring these dear people. I think the church in the West today has certain encouraging signs, at least in North America. There are a great number of young ministers who've embraced the doctrines of grace, really believe, say, the five points of Calvinism strongly, preach them. And that's uh, encouraging as far as it goes. What troubles me is three things. Number one, the church needs to go back to the Puritan emphasis on the regulative principle of worship. That nothing done in the worship service should be foreign to New Testament worship. And with a lot of the contemporary worship going on and ministers and sessions or consistories trying to please people and give them what they want in worship instead of going by what Scripture says worship is to be, I find that gravely negligent and damaging to the church. And I'm hoping and praying that this revived interest in Reformed theology in terms of soteriology would also carry over into ecclesiology in terms of worship. I think that's a, that's a dire need. Secondly, I think we live in a day in which the Christian church is far, far, far too permeated with worldliness. And what I'm missing in the new movement, whether you call it new Calvinism or other things, is, is this sense of godliness in the lives of many. I'm not saying all, of course, but it just seems like an oxymoron to me to believe in the five points of Calvinism and not to believe in a strong piety, a strong godliness like the Puritans and the Reformers embraced. And so I'm longing for the day when this movement will not only embrace the five points of Calvinism, but also a godly lifestyle and godly worship. And that leads me to my third thing, which I think is, is maybe the most important of all, is I think we need in the West more of what the Reformers and Puritans had. In fact, what America had until the 1830s with Charles Finney was all the notable preachers were called Reformed Experiential Preachers because they spoke from the heart of the preacher, exegeting the passage to the hearts of the people, the hearts of God's people. And to me, that's absolutely critical. And so we need to preach about our backsliding ways. We need to preach about how things should go in the Christian's life. The, the Romans 8 um, scenario. We need to preach about Romans 7, the the, how things do go in the Christian life, the struggles, the holy warfare, 
You need to preach about the end goal, Revelation 21, the glories that are yet to come, and being with Christ in heaven, and things that really resonate with the experience of the heart without falling into experientialism for its own sake. Uh, G.I. Packer put it well when he said, we need to return to what the Puritans had, where they would trace out the work of the Spirit in their soul, not to end in themselves, but so as to give all the glory to God. And so, all my life I've been trying to promote Reformed experiential preaching, and I do believe that there's some ripeness for it today. In fact, uh, Crossway Books has, is just publishing my, my book on Reformed experiential preaching, simply called Reformed Preaching. The subtitle is Preaching from the Heart of the Preacher to the Hearts of God's People. And actually, it's, as I speak now, it's being published uh, this week. And I'm hoping and praying that God will bless this very first book ever written on this subject. Charles Bridges has a couple chapters in his Christian ministry, but I'm praying that God will bless it to many, many preachers. Because I think problems in the, in the churches in the West begin in the pulpit with a lack of experiential preaching, uh, a kind of levity in the pulpit that takes away from the spirit of uh, godliness and uh, a willingness to abandon the regulative principle of worship. So I think these three things are three key areas I'd like to see uh, turned around. Could you uh, briefly summarize the regulative principles of worship? Yes. The regulative principle of worship means that you regulate all your worship according to what Scripture teaches. And since with the coming of Christ and the establishment of the New Testament church, the ceremonial laws are abolished, and just the principles remain, what you look at then is New Testament worship. And you say, how did the church worship in the New Testament? That's the way we're to worship today. Preaching and reading of the word and singing and, and giving offerings and, and benedictions and so on. But nowhere does the New Testament church go into other activities or other things. So the Reformed faith, and the Puritans were strong in this as well, always said you've got to do what the New Testament church does and don't add anything to it and don't subtract anything from it. Very different, say, from the Lutheran approach, which says as long as it doesn't contradict what the New Testament says, you can do it. So the Lutheran church would say, for example, you can have choirs in church because it doesn't really contradict fundamental principles of, of the New Testament. The Reformed and the Puritans would have said, at least up until the 1920th century, no, you don't have choirs in church because the New Testament church didn't have choirs in church. You just do what the New Testament church does. So there can be arguments over uh, incidentals in worship. For example, is an organ an incidental that just helps people sing? Or is it actually fundamentally part of, of the worship service? Um, because there's not mention of instruments in the New Testament. There was a lot of debate about that over, over the ages. But regular principle of worship means we just worship the way the New Testament prescribes to us. Going back to what you said later, um, it seems, and I say this quite a bit in these videos, but it's something that kind of is quite resonative with me is the difference between what we believe on paper and what we believe in practice. Uh -huh. So I think people are, are a lot more united on paper than they are in church life and how that theology, that those principles are actually applied in how church life is done, how evangelism is done. And there seems to be a separation of those two, what's here and what's here, Would that, and what's vertical and what's horizontal. Would that be fair? Do you think? Would that be would that tie in with what you're saying? Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's one thing then to believe the Reformed confessions and to really embrace um, solid historic evangelical truth, and it's another to put it in practice mm -hmm. without adding to Scripture, adding to the, that belief system with ideas that you think will draw people to church or and maybe they will but you've got to remember that whatever draws people to church you've got to keep doing in order to keep them in church yeah. 
and that's one of the problems we face today is that we're trying to do what pleases men to draw people in the church then we're trying to relate to them sort of the way the world does but the church can never match the world in entertainment the church needs to be the church in order to be faithful to the Word of God but also in order to really be used by the Holy Spirit in him forming people into new creations before God. If we use other means to bring people in and the gospel is tacked on as a side show, um, what does that say to them? It says that we actually, this isn't as important to us as this, you know, um, as these other things. Um, it kind of cheapens it, doesn't it, to say that actually you know, this isn't the great thing we're about. We're actually about you and about things that we all enjoy outside of Christ. Isn't that something yeah. that comes across from that? Yeah, yeah. When we contradict in practice what we teach on paper, we present people with an inconsistency which creates actually division rather than unity. And the end result is we end up trying to please man rather than to please God in worship. And when we do that, the church just goes downhill. It snowballs. And because if, you, if you're willing to do this to please man, when it's not recorded in Scripture, why not do another couple inches and another couple inches? And so it just constantly, there's no end to trying to please man. It, it constantly brings you into, into trouble. And that's exactly what many ministers are doing today and other church leaders, unfortunately, because they're so desperate to get a few more people in church. Once we go down that road, what ends up happening in the end is that even the things we think we believe, by our practice we contradict them so badly that people see our inconsistency and there's not a living vitality, a warm, godly, experiential reality of vital Christian living in that church. And when that is missing, the powerful witness of a, of a living church where the minister himself, where his life is a transcript of his sermons and there's consistency in him between what he is in the pulpit and what he is among the people and same thing with the elders, same thing with the deacons, same thing with God's people in the church. When that's missing, the church will run out of steam and people will see it for what it is and eventually it'll, it'll dissipate or It'll just be a social club in the end. I'm, I'm working on a, a couple of things right now that are, um, I'm hoping will be will be influential in, in a, a major way. We're investing at least a lot in it. One is a, a Puritan documentary that we're working on with Media Grazia. And what that does is it interviews people all over the world who are experts in Puritanism, and we're going to put together probably a 100 to 120 minute documentary. That will be a very professional documentary, in which we've interviewed people like um, John MacArthur, um, Jack Packer, uh, John Piper, Al Mohler, Sinclair Ferguson, a number of people like that, and, and many more, and what they thought about Puritanism. Or what they think about a Puritanism. At the same time, we're supplementing that with an introduction to Puritanism, a book written by Michael Reeves and myself, and 35 DVD lessons that are a bit deeper, not intellectual, however, not overly intellectual, but just a little deeper level than the intro. And um, that will have a workbook with it, and the whole package will sell for hundred dollars in US terms for those who who buy it as a pre-publication and it's going to come out next spring it's and it, it, it's its goal is to be an on-ramp to inform people about the Puritans get them interested in the Puritans excited about reading the Puritans and open their eyes to the warm vital relationship the Puritans had with God as something that we really need to get back to today. At the same time, I'm also working on a Puritan-minded uh, Reformed Systematic Theology, it's going to be called, 
with my TA, Paul Smalley, who's taking my notes of teaching systematics for the last 30 years or so. And um, what we're doing is doing a four volume set, about 1,200 pages per volume, that runs from prolegomena all the way to eschatology, doing the whole of systematic theology on an educated layman's level or first year seminary level. So the average church member who's interested in theology should have no trouble understanding it. And what we're doing in, in that set of books, of which the first volume is um, done now and uh, will be printed in March by Crossway Books on Prolegomena and the Doctrine of God. We're first taking each subject and looking at all the biblical data on it and proving various truths about that particular subject from the Bible. Then we switch over to church history, look at all the development of that doctrine in church history, and then the third part of each chapter is how do you take this doctrine and apply it experientially to souls and practically to lives. And we address in that also contemporary problems and issues, but the the goal of the set of books is to be a, a full-fledged systematic theology that is also Puritan-minded in its emphasis on practice and experiencing the truths that we profess to believe. We hope to do one volume a year, so it's a, it's a four-year project. Maybe the last volume will take a bit longer, um, maybe a five-year project. So we're praying that God will spare both of us and that we'll be able to persevere in this and bring out a new systematic theology that's um, conservatively reformed, solidly biblical, confessional, but also warmly experiential and practical for, for our generation.